Hey everyone, this is Tom from Burmy Bank. This is part two in my series on vermicomposting 101. And today I'm going to go over the different types of containers uh, that you can use uh, for setting up your vermicomposting system. And it's almost endless uh, what you can use. I mean, it comes down to how much you want to spend and basically what you're expecting out of the system. There's basically three major areas of containers, at least how I'm going to classify them. One is just open bins. So open bins would see any container that basically has, you know, four sides and a bottom and is probably open on the top. So that would cover all your Rubbermaid tubs, uh, a bathtub, uh, any of the wooden bins or uh, containers that you make out of wood. It's basically an open bin that you normally put some type of a loose lid over. Now the second type would be your stackable trays. Uh, that's like the Worm Factory 360 is probably the most popular. And they rely on basically using vertical migration. So the worms as you go through, as they go through the food, they work their way up. You put more food on and they just keep working their way up through the system. And the last one would be the CFTs, continuous flow through systems. And uh, there's kind of a couple areas within that. There's the fabric uh, continuous flow through systems, such as Vermibag, uh, the Urban Worm Bag. The Worm In was kind of one of the original ones. And I think uh, there's another one made in Australia uh, that's been out for a long time, the Swag Bag, I think it is. And uh, then you have the plastic continuous flow through systems like the hungry bin. And then you go into more commercial grade uh, continuous flow through systems. And uh, then you're talking one, a lot of money, and these are huge systems and they normally have mechanical means of harvesting the castings from the bottom. So for open bin containers, or you know, plastic containers, I mean, it can start as simple as this. I mean, if you wanted to take some worms to school, uh, you know, you could fill this up with a little bit of dirt or a little bit of uh, bedding. Put a few worms in here. It's really quick and easy for the kids to open it up, you know, dig around a little bit in it and see the worms and stuff. But as far as a, you know, permanent system, of course, it's way too small. It's not deep enough, can't hold enough worms, and uh, it just isn't going to work. You're not going to produce hardly any castings or anything out of it. But for a visual aid to take to a, a presentation to a school, it'll work just fine. Now, if you go a little bit bigger, I used one similar to this. Now, this is just a plastic container that's, you know, about one foot by, you know, a foot and a half, roughly. It's probably 10 inches deep. This, this works pretty good. I mean, it actually has a fairly big surface area. So put your bedding in here and stuff, the worm's going to have enough depth to, you know, actually produce some castings. It doesn't have a lid. Uh, now, you could find some that have a plastic lid like the Rubbermaid totes that snap on and stuff. But a lot of times people that have the open systems like this, they just place something over the top of it and put a weight on it. If you have the right bedding and the right uh, environment, the worms aren't going to try and get out of there. Normally when the worms are trying to escape out of the system, it's telling you there's something wrong with the system. So if you're running the system correctly, 99% of the times the worms are going to stay in your system. Another good, probably the most popular system that people use is these Rubbermaid tubs. Uh, I don't know how big these are, you know, these are 10, 15, 15 gallon or something, but you can get them in all kinds of different sizes. And they're nice because they have a lid on it. They'll keep things out. They're not going to keep worms in because those lids do not seal tight enough. The worms could easily crawl out of there. And fruit flies and things like that can pretty easily get in too. But it'll keep the mice out of it and things like that. Now if you're going to get a system like this, the problem with systems like this is they don't breathe very well. So you need to punch holes at least in the side to try and get some air into the system. And the other problem is they hold moisture a lot. And vegetables and stuff like that have a lot of moisture. So 
you either need to double stack them like this and drill holes in the bottom of this first one so the moisture can drip out into the bottom or you need to really monitor your system if you're only going to use a single one and make sure it's not getting too wet on the bottom. Because one of the big no-nos in uh, vermicomposting is letting your system go anaerobic. What anaerobic means is there's no oxygen. That normally occurs when you have too much moisture in the bottom of a system like this and there's absolutely no oxygen flow down there. If you put worms into a bunch of water, they're happy. They're fine to live in water because they can get oxygen through their skin through the water because there's oxygen in water. But if you have stagnant water in the bottom of a plastic bin or a tub like this here that has no airflow, there's no oxygen in it whatsoever. And when the worms get down inside there, they're going to die. And once they start dying, it starts stinking, you're going to have a mess. And one more final uh, container that's real popular, and, and rightfully so, because it works pretty well, and that's just a five gallon bucket. Uh, I prefer these Lowe's buckets. I mean, they're cheap, and the lid that comes, uh, that you get with these things, fits pretty doggone tight. I mean, this will, for the most part, keep the worms in. They won't normally get out of this lid if you have it snapped all the way in. And like this, I had drilled a hole in here for ventilation through here. And if you want, you can drill a hole on the side to get ventilation here or in the bottom. And you can double stack them if you want, or you can have a second bucket collect any leachate that happens to drip through. Capacity-wise, you know, you have about a square foot, roughly. And I mean, the general rule is about a pound of worms for, per square foot of surface area. Because it's really the surface area that matters the most. Not completely but it matters about the most uh, if you depending on the type of worms because some worms tend to stay deeper than other worms uh, red wigglers tend to stay right on the surface for the most part where European night crawlers and stuff tend to go a little bit deeper uh, and I'll go over that some more once I do the series on worms one of the big issues though with any open bin system is once you get ready to harvest it there's no way to just reach down into this system because what you want in these systems, I don't care if it's the Rubbermaid totes, the buckets, or any of the others, what you want is right here on the bottom. And once you fill the system up and you let the worms do their work, it's the bottom of the system where your finished castings are. And you can't just easily get down there and take those out. So you're kind of stuck with let the worms compost it completely and then either dump out the system and then separate the worms from the castings or try and do some type of a horizontal migration if your system's long enough. You wouldn't be able to do that in a bucket. Your real, only, only real option on a bucket is to dump it out and do separation by hand. And that takes time. I mean, and to me, my time is probably my most valuable commodity. So I want something that's quicker. I don't want to have to spend a lot of time harvesting. And again, when I do the series on harvesting, I'll go in depth and kind of show you the different possibilities. So what are the advantages and disadvantages to the open bin systems? One of the biggest advantages is cost. Things are cheap. I mean, you probably have something in your garage that'll work. You have an old Rubbermaid tub that'll work. You buy this bucket for a couple bucks and a lid for a buck. And, and you got an operational system and it'll work. A lot of people successfully run these type of systems all the time. So I can't knock them completely. I mean, I don't particularly care for them. I want something that's easier. But they do work. And almost everybody starts out with this type of system. I mean, I did myself. But I quickly migrated to a continuous flow type systems. Uh, and again, you can make them out just out of almost anything. I mean, it's a big deal. Disadvantages they're difficult to harvest. Uh, you, most of the systems, you have to completely dump them out and do a hand separation of the worms from the castings, and that takes a bunch of time. Uh, if you have a system like the Rubbermaid totes a little bit longer or a bathtub or something like that, you can do a horizontal migration a lot of times with those. But there's some disadvantages to that, too, because of the cocoons that are left behind. 
unless you do a horizontal migration and, and give it at least 21 days, you're going to end up with cocoons in your final product. Moisture. Uh, especially the plastic containers, there's a huge deal with moisture. They, they tend to hold moisture unless you can get enough ventilation in them. And the more holes you punch into them, the more likely you are to get other things in there. The screens don't always stay on. It gets to be a little bit of a pain. And weight. Um, if you fill up one of these Rubbermaid tubs and fill it up fairly full, once it's completely composted, it is going to weigh a ton. You are not going to want to lift it and move it around at all. You'd be surprised how heavy that would be. Even a five gallon bucket completely full of compost, it's just as heavy as water. So fill this thing up with water and see how heavy it is. Stackable trays are the next one. Now, I've never actually owned like a Worm Factory 36 or anything like that. I did make some stackable trays once out of some system like this. The basic principle between stackable trays is you start the system off with a bottom tray and you put material in the bottom tray and as that tray gets full, when it gets completely full, you put another tray that has basically a, a means for the worms to get through the bottom of it on top of it. And the worms, as they finish all this food, in principle, they'll come on up into the next area and they'll start working on this area. Once this one's full, you add another one on top of that, and so on. So you can have these trays get fairly uh, tall. I didn't have any luck at all with this, but uh, if, if you look through the forums and on the internet and stuff, some people, I mean, they have pretty good success with it. One of the big uh, issues I see a lot is the amount of leachate that collects in the bottom tray and the fact that all the worms, uh, are, there's a lot of worms still in each of the trays as you pull it out. Now, it kind of has the same principle as a continuous flow through system, one of the bags, except instead of just adding food, you have to add another tray, and then you add more food and you keep, and then to remove the bottom tray to do your harvest, you have to lift all these trays out, grab the bottom tray, which is supposedly completely finished, pull it out, and then set these trays back on. So there's a lot of lifting and moving and stacking and stuff that's involved with it. And again, I, I've seen reviews where people, you know, they either love it or they hate their system. So. I can't speak again directly for having one of the, the systems. I've never tried one. But the one that I made, I didn't care for too much. It, it just didn't seem to work all that well. The last type of system that I'm going to look at are the continuous flow through systems. Of course, this happens to be a Vermi bag, uh, Vermi bag mini, to be uh, it's precise. And how the continuous flow through systems work, and again, this is whether or not it's a vermi bag or a worm bag or a swag bag, an old worm in, a hungry bin, they all work basically the same. And how that is, all you do on these is you add food in the top and you basically harvest from the bottom. So you start the system out with a small amount of bedding at the bottom and then you just continuously add a little bit more bedding, a little food, a little more bedding, a little bit more food and just keep working it up, food and bedding, food and bedding, food and bedding. And worms, for the most part, tend to stay in the top six to eight inches, you know, uh, of, of the system. Now again, red wigglers tend to stay really close to the surface, the European night crawlers a little bit deeper. And so as you add more food to this system, and the, this system begins to get full, the worms are going to move up. They're going to stay up here where the food's at. And so eventually the bottom here is just finished castings. And so there'll hardly be any worms at all down there. Now occasionally the first time you harvest it, there'll be some worms that hang out there in the bottom. But after the, at least the second harvest or the third harvest, there won't be hardly any worms at all down in the bottom here. All the worms will be up here in the top. So once you've been running this system for four months, you can basically just unzip the bottom here, reach up inside here, pull out about two or three gallons of castings uh, out of the mini. Out of the max, you can get about five gallons, and 
out of the Manamath you can get, you know, well over 10 gallons. And then once you pull your castings out, you reset the system by pushing on the sides, meaning everything will drop back down. Then you just keep feeding more food into it. So again, they say feed the top, harvest the bottom. But you don't have to move the trays around, change any trays. And the nice thing about the fabric CF, uh, continuous flow through systems, is they breed very well. These systems breathe a little bit through the material. The material is coated, so it doesn't breathe a lot, but there is some breathing that goes on. It breathes through the zippers, and it breathes through the top, and also the top zipper. So you get this continuous flow of air through these. So like a vermi bag will never go anaerobic. Probably impossible for it to go anaerobic. There's so much airflow through the system, even if you're running the system really wet, it's not gonna go anaerobic. There's plenty of oxygen in the system. And worms love wet, oxygen-rich environments. So the worms are gonna do great. But if you go to harvest it when it's wet like that, your castings are gonna be difficult to uh, screen. So you still need to maintain moisture on vermi bags. You don't wanna run them too wet because then your castings are gonna come out. But any of the continuous flow through systems operate on the same principle. And they're very low maintenance. There's really nothing you need to do with them other than feed them and harvest them. So literally feeding it once a week, depending on how many worms you're having here, will determine how much food you have to give it. Maybe five minutes a week, and you can maintain a system like this. So to try and summarize uh, the different types of containers real quickly, again, it's almost endless the type of containers you could use. You have, you know, from the very, very inexpensive to the super, super expensive, and everything in between. If you're starting out a new system and you're uncertain whether or not you want to try this, I, I think going with a Rubbermaid tub or a five-gallon bucket is fine as long as you try and do it properly. You know, maintain the moisture, um, use the correct bedding, watch how you feed it and stuff. But there's a lot more risk at failing with the Rubbermaid systems and uh, some of the open type containers versus a continuous flow through system. These, system. these systems are much more forgiving than a Rubbermaid tote. Rubbermaid totes, again, are notorious for holding too much moisture. And if you have too much moisture and no oxygen, again, it creates the big problem of an anaerobic condition and you end up killing a lot of worms off. And cost is always a factor. Uh, Continuous flow through systems for a vermi bag start out, you know, about a hundred bucks. Uh, where you can go down and buy a Rubbermaid tote for, you know, ten bucks. But you have a lot better chance of being successful on vermicomposting if you, you know, use like a continuous flow type system. That's not saying that you won't be successful using a Rubbermaid tote, but because you most certainly can. Uh, like I said before, lots and lots of people do it all the time. They also do them in uh, like mortar trays. So there's no reason you can't do it that way. Now, looks, that's another thing, aesthetics. Uh, if I was going to place my vermicomposting system somewhere where everybody's going to see it, let's say inside your house, the difference between having a Rubbermaid tote and a vermi bag is a big difference. Uh, that was one of the big factors in making the vermi bag because I was trying to get my wife to put a vermicomposting system in her classroom and every single solitary system I showed her, she said, I'm not putting that in my classroom, I'll put it outside. <laughs> and I'd try another system and she'd say, I'm not putting that in my classroom, I'll put it outside. And so I ended up making her one, something that was looked nice enough that she would actually put it in her classroom. So, lots of containers. Most of them will probably work. It really comes down to how you operate the system, how you maintain it, you know, how much maintenance is in there. And I think the key points to this are actually coming up in the next couple videos, and that will be bedding and moisture. Because those are the two critical things that are gonna, you have to balance right, otherwise you're gonna have a system that's out of kilter.
And I forgot to mention the disadvantages of especially fabric CFTs. Uh, for the fabric ones, the biggest one really is that you, it's difficult to run them outdoors because they're made out of fabric. If you have rats, mice, possum, raccoon, that kind of stuff, they can pretty easily, you know, gnaw through this. I mean, the vermi bags are made out of uh, ballistic nylon cordura, so they're tough. I mean, they're really tough materials, top of the line material, but that's nothing for a rat or a mouse to chew through. If they want to get eat worms, they're going to chew right through it. So you'd have to take extra precautions. Uh, you could make a wood stand and put some uh, chicken wire type stuff around it to protect it from the larger critters and stuff, but just for mice, it's difficult to keep them out of there. So if you have a plastic type system, whether it be a plastic CFT like a hungry bin or these Rubbermaid tubs and stuff, that's, they're much easier to keep uh, critters and stuff out of it if you have the system outside. Uh, if you're inside your garage or inside the house, it's a totally different uh, issue and there are the vermi bags and fabric, other fabric uh, continuous flow through systems will do just fine. So that's it for containers. This is Tom from Vermi Bag. Ciao.